Thank you. So um, anyway, do you have questions about, I know um, uh, your professor was talking about um, some of my, my works that you have discussed in class. Um, so far, they've read the Manila Envelope, and then on Wednesday, they're going to start your um, flash fiction. Oh, oh, good. Water Buffalo. So, um, if you could just inspire us about poetry and Southeast Asian literature, and <laughs> what inspires you as a poet, or anything you want to share or ask the students. Okay, well, um... Now, it's interesting because I had just started a podcast series and, um, and I have already interviewed three poets that I've, I'm familiar with. Um, one is Eileen Tabios, Filipino-American uh, poet. Another one was Barbara Jane Reyes from the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area. And the other one is Irena... Lara Silva, she's a Mexican American poet. So I am, um, my goal in this podcast is to interview um, poets, writers, and artists, um, particularly people that I know first, and then expand from there. I want it to be kind of like um, cross genre, um, international. So um, right now, I'm, I'm featuring um, mostly from the Filipino-American community that I'm familiar with, but it will expand from there. So um, I just felt that there needed to be a, a, a platform, and also it's where other poets and writers can share their craft among each other. Um, what inspires them? How do they get ideas? Things like that. Um, so it was interesting so far, the uh, kind of um, information that I've learned from them, you know, as well. Um, now, I started writing poetry, gosh, I want to say since I was in high school. Um, of course, I wasn't trained then. It was just all a matter of, oh, I just want to, you know, express my emotions and things like that. And um, I've also, um, I think it started off with singing lyrics, music lyrics, you know? Um, but then I wanted to kind of like expound on that and then I found the written word. Um, and so it grew from that. And, you know, I've had my first, I wanna say, you know, as, as a starting poet, you just trying to find your voice, you know, um, you mimic other writers that you, you know, you think are cool and that you can connect with, but it's not really you, you know, it's not your essence yet. So it, that is a journey, I have to say, and it's evolution. Um, so interesting that when I was coming up, it was like mid 90s, late 90s, I was in the East Coast area, um, Connecticut, New York area. And I had linked up with Filipino American poets in New York. And um, had kind of uh, did some collaboration, um, did some, you know, met up at the University of Connecticut um, for a conference there. So anyways, Throughout the years, um, I haven't been connected with them because I moved to Florida. You know, I went to college in Micronesia. I taught there. But, you know, so throughout the years, we've stayed in contact. And thank goodness for Facebook because that's how we did it. Um, <laughs> we learned each other's publications um, and, and their, their latest events and things like that. Um, now, there are two schools right now that I'm aware of. There's um, the New York, and then of course the um, the East Coast and the West Coast. And oh, I have discussed that this um, phenomena in my podcast with Barbara Jane Reyes. Um, and it was almost it, I, I have to say, and I guess we can concur that this is a, a movement, a, a Filipino American movement, um, because um, we had um, for those who have studied. 
um, Filipino American writing. There's not too many. There's um, uh, who was it that you um, uh, you, you taught Monica? Um, Rizal. Rizal. Now he was a, a, he was more a revolutionary, um, but there was also um, ones that came up during the the uh, migrant. Um, you know, the farmers in uh, California. Um, so that, that movement there, and that was the Bulosan, that was maybe in 20s and 30s, um, but nothing since then. So it's like, um, I won't say nothing, but very, very few. So this boom in the 80s and 90s, actually in the 70s, there were some in academia that were, there were coming up and connecting, but it was a boom in the 90s, and then hence, fast forward to now, there's a, a good amount of us now. So um, we had the fight against invisibility in the canon, the literary canon. Um, so, and it's interesting, um, Micronesian um, literary uh, works are, um, are coming up now. I believe that it's happening to them as it is was happening to us in the 90s. They're discovering. Um, I know uh, Craig Santos Perez of University of Hawaii. Um, he is a, you know, a champion to get in all those um, Micronesian Pacific Island voices out there into the forefront. Okay, so um, this is where we are in the, you know, as far as the Asian American or Filipino American. I know there's a lot of uh, Asian American under the, the, that umbrella. Um, so, and what else? Uh, as you know, I, I was born and raised in the Philippines. Um, and I grew up um, during, well, after, I, at, after Vietnam conflict, um, I was a military child. My my biological father was a U.S. Air Force member. My mom is Filipina. Um, so he got deployed to Vietnam and we never, she never heard from him again um, and probably thought the worst, of course, because they didn't have the internet. They didn't have anything, you know, like that to keep contact, right? So she met my stepfather and life went on and they got married. He adopted me when I was two years old. I have a brother, I have a sister and two brothers. So I'm the oldest out of all. Um, and so we grew up as military children. Um, uh, basically went to the school system, the Dep Department of Defense school system, which is the military, um, you, know, def you know, you're familiar with that, right, Monica? Um, so yeah, and I graduated there in 85 and then I went stateside and I have not gone back since, unfortunately, the closest I've gone to was Pompeii, Micronesia <laughs> and that's it, but I plan to, it's, it's in, you know, in my plans to go back and, you know, visit home again and, uh, visit my relatives I haven't seen in a very, very, very long time. So any questions as far as um, the Manila envelope? Um, you'll have to come to the front because the microphone is on the table. So <laughs> <laughs> like she can't attack you. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> so she can hear your question. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, excuse me, what inspired you to compose this poem? Oh, yes. Interesting. Um, what inspired me? Um, just the idea, and, and, and if you've noticed, uh, in fact, my, let me just backtrack a little bit. My latest poetry collection by Astrolabes and Constellation, which is out now, um, if you can go on my website, you, you know, you can purchase one there. But anyways, that, the, the theme of that collection 
is about it's it's a lot of nautical theme a lot of migration thoughts of migration so those that kind of imagery have has stuck with me has been with me since childhood my mother's family were fishermen so i have a lot of that influence in in my writing as well and it seems like wherever I go, I am by the water. So when I was in Connecticut, I was by the water. When I was here, I'm here in Florida, I'm by the water. When I was in Micronesia, by the So if you, if you notice the, the migration pattern, things like that. So the Manila envelope, if you look at the stanzas, um, I talked about, you know, this, um, hold on, let me see if I can pull it up so I can have reference to it. Um, it's, okay, so, I, you know, I open up the, the poem and I reference the actual envelope, right? If, you, if I, I imagine this envelope um, and I'm, I see it on the ground and it's, it's trampled and then it reverts to, it, it kind of, uh, takes you into another, uh, into my memory of my so-called um, motherland, birth country in the city Manila. Um, and then I speak of the conditions there. And then if you notice, third stanza, I go into merchant ships, again, nautical themes, okay? And I sailed along the coast um, even way before discovery of flight, live stories, songs, travails, like seedlings stuck to tender tendrils that germinate the lover, empress, who will never be exalted. So, and then now the next stanza, you see the, the, uh, the speaker talk about reaching for it down, you know, the, the manila envelope is on the, on the ground now. And then the speaker poses a question, jostle for appellation for those soggy poems within it. Okay, so who can guess what that means, the soggy poems within it? Anyone want to guess? Um, he said the fisherman's poems. The fisherman what? Yeah, there's reference to that as well. But also, when you think of envelopes, you think of paper or something in it, right? Yes. Yeah. So these poems are my poems, particularly maybe a collection of poems. And why are they soggy? Because in the beginning of the stanza, I said this envelope is trampled on the ground, things like that. Yeah. So it's telling, it's like, it, it's, it moves you into some kind of scene, okay? Uh, and the last scene, reach for it. And, and the speaker is um, saying, you reach for it, Joshua Appalachian, for these soggy poems within it. Leavening words, sodden with seawater, there again, the sea nautical themes. Aged as yesterday's yeast, whomever, whomever receives this massy missive. Missive is of course letter. Save the damned, save the poor. Now if you notice um, in the second stanza, I referred to malformed bodies of beggars, pendulous stumps, and bare feet, okay? So when I thought of Manila, I didn't think of it as this, you know, pure, pristine, perfect city. It is impoverished. I remember a lot of parts of it is very impoverished. So when in the last, the last two lines refers to that. Whoever receives this nasty missive, meaning the poems within this envelope, save the damned, save the poor. 
And that is the message. Okay, does that help? I mean, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I have a question. I think some students and myself as well get confused. When is the poet the speaker, and when is the speaker separate from the poet? That's interesting. Um, it's always the speaker. You cannot assume that the speaker is the poet because there's also what we call persona poems where the speaker is not who you think is, you know, the sub, the, the, you think it's the, the poet, but it's not, it's a persona poem. So when talking about literature um, and poems, we always refer to the, the poet, the speaker, okay? So um, now if you wanna know if it's actually a poet, well, that's where you kind of study the poet's life, <laughs> right? Yeah, so you, you have to study the poet's life and, and kind of follow the work as it evolves through you know, the years and things like that. And then you can derive, you know, okay, yes, you know, this is the, 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 the poet's life's experiences and you can, you can compare and contrast what you find in the poem or in the collection, okay? But when you write um, a paper on a particular poem, um, you know, you often refer to the poet, the speaker. Okay, good question. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, hello. <laughs> um, so I have a question regarding the Manila Avalok. Yes. Honestly, I'm really inspired by your uh, poetic masterpiece, and I, it really tell the story of, it really convey the tone of majestic and also like the door, the door feeling of like trying to save the unfortunate one as I read by. So I have a question. So basically, mm -hmm. like, how would you revise the poem if the title is now the 21st century Manila Envelope? Wow, that is an interesting question. Mm. So if it's the 21st Manila Envelope, like right now, as opposed to, so I don't know if, do you, do you feel that this poem was, uh, about or written in another era? I think it is my uh, around like, like the 19th of 20th because it, the last night really convey the fact that I saved me the poor, saved me the unfortunate one. So I assume that like it's during the era where the Filipinos are still like maybe other independent and colonization by. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I feel like this will be completely the past era before like the Philippines become fully independent. Um, I I only can hear bits and pieces of that. Um, he was saying that um his impression was it captured the Philippines during the oppressive period of colonization where they were very poor, but um. Maybe his impression now is that the Philippines is growing, there's hope, there's freedom, and okay. not as many poor people. Um, yeah, okay. Um, well, it's still, I feel that the poem is actually still relevant um, because it is not, there's still a lot of people there, from my understanding, uh, still suffering and uh, still impoverished. Um, that I don't think that will go away. Um, who knows? I hope it goes, you know, I hope it improves. But um, yeah, they're growing in a sense. Um, uh, I guess a lot more than when I was growing up there. But it's still my understanding. I still have relatives there. They still struggle. And um, there's still, you know, a lot, there's, and still the effects of colonialism. Now we live in the post-colonial um, era, so we're still we're still um, 
you know, dealing with those residual effects, if you will. Um, but the 21st century, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, no, no, that I think it still applies very much so today. Thank you so much for your question. Anybody else? Well, while they're thinking, um, <laughs> like, um, the students speak two or three languages. Um, is there a difference be between writing poetry in English and writing poetry in another language? Um, have you written any poetry in another language or do you focus mo mostly in English? Yes. Um, I. I was uh, told to stop uh, speaking my mother's language when I was in kindergarten. And ever since that happened, I never really got a chance to learn my mother's language again fluently as I did. Um, so unfortunately, no, I'm not capable of writing in another language. Um, but I know a lot of writers who do, who do, yes. And do they see a difference? between writing in English and writing in another language, or do, are they the same person and it translates well for them? Oh, I mean, it, it, you, mean it, the, uh, you mean translation of a poem into another language? Or the when they switch between languages, are they the same poet? So if oh, you- Yeah, I believe they are. I mean, in fact, I, in my podcast series, um, Barbara Jane Reyes, um, she, I think, believe she's fluent in Tagalog. And in one of her collections, um, she writes in English, in Spanish, and in Tagalog, which is Filipino. Um, and uh, interesting what she, she does, she, um, this uh, fantastic interplay with Spanish and Tagalog, because, you know, the Philippines had been colonized from the Spanish way before the Americans for about 200 years. So there's a lot of the um, words and language and expressions that we have adopted, but that we have different spellings. So what she will do is have the same word in Spanish juxtaposed with the same word in Tagalog. Now they sound the same, but when you read it, they're different. You know, they got a different spelling. So yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of um, interesting things that come out from um, you know experiencing with other languages. In, you know, in in that context, certainly. Here's another question. Um, so I wanted to ask a question about like your writing style in general. Like, as we can see that, like, uh, figurative language and, like, the literary devices, frames, like, certain, like, in sense of alliteration and so on play an important role for the structure of poetry itself. So I wanted to ask, like, are you, like, um, the, the way of writing, are you more comfortable with, like, going freestyle with the poetry or just, are you, the structure of it with a certain figurative language. Ah, okay. Well, you know, I, I use a lot of uh, imagery, okay? So, and concrete imagery, meaning that, you know, um, you, I tie in an image with something concrete. Um, and then, of course, uh, elusive imagery, you know, um, symbolism, you know, uh, so in, in in the manila envelope has several imageries there. Um, so yes, I, that's, that's, that's how I structure my poems. Um, they're not, of course, the rhyming or anything of that sort. Um, it's free verse. Um, I do pay attention to alliteration, certainly. Yes, I love that. I love the, the way um, alliteration sets the tone, well, sets the rhythm of a piece. So it, they, they say that having alliteration is um, almost like music, you know, you get that same, and it's in, it has a, a kind of rhythm to it. So, and it, if I, if I pull this again, I'll show you, um, let me see if it has uh, 
any um how about um okay a mud stained envelope trampled you hear that all the d's and threadbare on the ground reminds me of manila the city in my birth and then i i changed from there but if you notice that there's certain um, lines that are the same sounds you know so yeah i do uh i do play with that a lot i didn't notice that so thank you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um our time is coming to an end so before we go um I know you haven't become rich yet from being a poet. So what no. makes you persevere in writing? And we might have some secret poets among us yeah. um, <laughs> to pursue their own careers. And how can they do maybe their business as well as pursuing their artistic side at the same time as they move through adulthood? Well, it is the, uh, the the writers and poets dilemma, and especially in this day and age, um, and it's okay. I mean, there's so many poets out there who are not doing the literary job, you know, anything that has to do with writing. In fact, I, I did a lot of technical stuff before, you know, all in between, you know, pursuing my education in in creative writing. Um, and I, I dabble in visual arts also. So what keeps me persevering is the, the, the beauty of creating something, you know? And then if you are serious about this route in, 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 in creative writing, you, you must please um, network with fellow poets and writers. That's all, I, I mean, that is, that is tantamount um, in your, in your um, creative growth. Um, and read, please read, 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 read other works. Okay. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's possible. It, of course, there's so many people who are doing it that way. And, um, in fact, who was the, uh, insurance salesman? I don't know if it was e e Com Well, one of the, the great poets, I mean, they, they had these tremendous careers in other, you know, things that are not related to poetry or writing or anything like that. Um, who was it, the one who, who wrote The Red Wheelbarrow? I forget. But he was a, a doctor. So, you know, so absolutely. Um, please uh, do explore if this interests you, by all means. Um, but go ahead and connect with other writers. Um, reach out to to writers and poets that you admire, um, things like that. And thank you for answering our questions. Do you have any questions you would like to ask the students? Absolutely. So um, what other poets have you already studied? Um, uh, they read um, <laughs> <laughs> Hello, um, I, am, I have been really interested in Victorian English, so oh. one of the um, poets that I admire was the Bronte sisters. Okay. So I um, actually did uh, an analysis on the um, on Charlotte Bronte's Evening Solace for my uh, course as well. Yeah. yeah. And Victorian English really inspires me to understand more about English literature. So, yeah. That's very good. I love, I love the Bronte sisters. Um, interesting because in that era, um, women's writing were, is not, was not acknowledged. Um, in fact, it was very um, unheard of. So they were a phenomenon in their era. And, you know, when you study them, it's, you're probably going to also study women in literature because there's a lot of women that have written, well, not a lot, of, of course, but the women that have written in that era, the Victorian era, 
um, had to go against a lot of difficulties um, to to get acknowledged or you know things like that. So yeah, I love I love the Bronte sisters. That's great. And so um, who who out there in your class uh, is um, have published? No, not yet. Not entirely published, but I used to um, compose a lot and post it onto my Facebook page. <laughs> okay, well that's 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 a start. I didn't have Facebook then. <laughs> Certainly would have done that. <laughs> but no, that's great. You uh, do. I encourage you to keep writing and reading and exploring um, the different voices, and especially connecting with the voices that does speak to you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and, the, and you're gonna be um, you're gonna be reading my my flash fiction. Yes. Do you have any questions about that? Um, we will, so we might need a part two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.